Hello and welcome to Inside EcoDevo, an economic development podcast helping Missourians prosper. On this episode, we're talking about the Missouri Community Service Commission, better known as MCSC, and sitting down with us to help with the discussion is Brittany Stifler Crabtree, Executive Director for MCSC. Brittany, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, happy that you're here. Really interested in getting into MCSC. It's it's not something I know a lot of about, but I know a lot of good things happen there. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Before we get into that, however, if you could just give us a little bit of background on yourself. How did you come to be the executive director for MCSC? Yeah, well, thank you again for having me. It is the first day of spring, so it's a new season uh, for me too, having moved to Jefferson City less than three months ago. So I'm from Topeka, Kansas, at least for the last 15 years, originally from Indiana, uh, but it's great to be here in Missouri. My folks retired to Missouri, and I've had my eye on this beautiful state for a long time. Reflecting on your question, 10 years ago, I was the executive director of the Kansas Volunteer Commission. At that time, Kansas was fourth in the nation for volunteerism. Missouri, for the record, is 10th. So we're going to get that number up. We have some work to do. Right. (laughs) But 10 years ago, as ED of that Kansas commission, I was overseeing brand recognition, uh, increasing the visibility of the organization, and also making sure the commission aligned with that governor's priorities at the time. So 10 years later, it's pretty cool to be doing it again. I think brand recognition is right there at the top for MCSC. That's why I'm glad to do this podcast. And aligning with the governor's priorities, whoever that governor may be, and today, Governor Parson, making sure that we're fulfilling his priorities is important to me as an executive director. There's a couple other things I'd add in about my background. I worked for the Corporation for National and Community Service. It's now called the AmeriCorps Agency, Um, but that gave me the federal lens on all of these commissions and their state-level work. And at that time, I oversaw compliance in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma and Louisiana. So that's a really good perspective for somebody coming into statewide compliance. I mean, we do a lot of amazing work at the commission. I don't want to act like it's just compliance, but making sure that our grantees have the tools they need to succeed is a huge part of our job. And I'm glad to have that federal background. And then looking at it from one other lens, I'm an AmeriCorps alum. So I, in my 20s, served with AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps in Washington, D.C. And Every commission has a portfolio of AmeriCorps programs, and AmeriCorps members are serving in those programs. So having been a member is really important, I think, for an executive director to make sure that the commission is doing the bottom line of making sure that those that are out there serving are enjoying their service and making an impact. Yeah, and AmeriCorps is something I'm sure we'll dive into and and talk about as the discussion goes on. Uh, Just out of curiosity, what was the calling, so to speak, for you to do volunteerism and and such as a career sounds like you've been doing it for quite a while. Yeah. Well, first of all, if anybody's listening to this podcast that currently is volunteering in their community, I just say it can be a career. And I think that's a really empowering concept. You start out volunteering about a cause you believe in, and it can turn into something that sustains your family too through employment. So it's a great way to get involved in communities and figure out where your passions lie. I was active in high school volunteering I went into college at Wichita State University, and my first year of college was good, but I needed to see the world more, right? I think a lot of young people can relate to this idea of having trouble focusing in the classroom right out of high school, wanting to see the world. AmeriCorps and Triple C gave me the opportunity to do that. So I was deployed for a year to Washington, D.C., and every six weeks we traveled to a different region. We were placed with a team of diverse individuals, and it just opens up your world. Once AmeriCorps did that for me, AmeriCorps Class 10, so back in the day for a lot of folks serving now, it just opened my eyes that it could be a career. So since then, I've served under four governors, both parties. Governor Parson is my fifth governor to serve under, and I believe in the dignity of the office. So I believe that we are here to serve the people, and no matter what the party is, We're here to make sure that we all continue serving for the common good. And so I've just stayed with it. And so it's amazing to be back with the commission. There's 52 commissions in this country. There's 52 individuals making sure that AmeriCorps funding is getting distributed in an equitable way. And I get to do that for Missouri. It's really an honor. Yeah, it sounds like you come with a a lot of experience. So uh, we're happy you're here and let's dive into it. What is MCSC? What do you guys do? Yeah, so the Missouri Community Service Commission was founded in 94 here in Missouri. We were founded first by the National and Community Service Trust Act of 1993. 
So that act on the federal level provided new federal resources to fulfill unmet service needs and promote volunteerism across the country. It was established with the idea that public-private partnerships matter. So if we're going to allocate public funding, we need to secure private funding to show local investment. And there's also a local control element. We are a governor-appointed commission. And I mentioned earlier to align with the governor's priorities. And that's very intentional because we don't want D.C. deciding where these funds should go in Missouri. We want to make sure that these governor appointed individuals help determine where the funds go. So the uh, vision of MCSC is to make sure that Missourians know they have the ability to volunteer, just get them connected to those opportunities, inspire them to serve. But our mission is to strengthen Missouri communities through volunteerism and service. So part of what we do is promote volunteerism, like the Show Me Service Awards that we'll talk about, trainings that we hope to host in the months and years to come to just build the volunteer network. And then on the other side, we've got service. And when we talk about service, we're talking about AmeriCorps members. And the reason we define it as service and not volunteerism is that it requires a commitment. So many hours you know, a duration of time. There's a living stipend that goes with that. And so that kind of commitment has a different term, service. So volunteerism and service, that's what we do at MCSC. Okay. Any kind of metrics on the number of communities or cities or what have you that MCSC is serving currently or has served? I'm not sure exactly if you guys break it up by a yearly thing or or a physical or whatnot, but uh, any kind of metrics on the number of citizens that you guys are servicing? Yeah, so obviously it does evolve at any moment in time, but recently the national data came out. I mentioned earlier Kansas was fourth in the nation 10 years ago for volunteerism. Just in the last three months, the data came out for Missouri. It's conducted in partnership with the census, and Missouri is 10th in the nation. And so we're able to dig into that data to learn that AmeriCorps members, both the younger ones and also AmeriCorps seniors, which is a special program for those 55 and up, They served at more than 600 locations across Missouri in the time frame that was studied. It was a one-year time frame during the pandemic. So I'm really proud to see Missouri show up in the top 10 for formal volunteerism. And then there's additional data out there to show how much volunteering happened informally, just helping our neighbors during the COVID-19 pandemic. But all in all, more than 6,000 Americans of all ages and backgrounds served here in Missouri. And uh, the economic impact of that is can be measured in many different ways, but I'll just share that we documented a $3.1 billion impact to the state of Missouri through our formal volunteerism alone. Yeah, I was going to ask why MCSC is embedded in economic development. Like, why is that the home of MCSC? But I'm guessing the answer is there's a direct tie in, in how this volunteerism helps businesses, which helps communities, which helps prosperity, which is what economic development is all about. Exactly. It's people power, right? And the more you can think of it twofold, one is the individuals themselves. There's studies that show that our mental health improves when we help one another. So there's just a very personal reason to get out there and volunteer, which is to feel connected. I know it's one way that I'm going to get to know Jefferson City is go out and volunteer. It's, how, it's a great way to meet folks. It's, it can be selfish. It can be building your resume. And then on the other side of that, when we have people getting out there and contributing to the well-being of their community, that does have an economic impact. There's a dollar value to volunteerism, whether it's a volunteer with no experience or a skilled volunteer. We're tracking that on a national level, and we're tracking the impact of all those volunteers getting out in communities. And I think it's very strategic that Missouri places MCSC within the Department of Economic Development. I got to tell you, that doesn't happen nationwide. I love having the national perspective to share that in Kansas, it's in the Department of Education. So in that state, they're looking at it as an education tool, civic engagement, and volunteerism is something you do as being a citizen. That's an interesting lens. Here in Missouri, it's economic development. In some states, it's right inside the governor's office as we align with priorities. So it's that local control that changes where it is. And I really think it's a nice, nice fit in the Department of Economic Development because it is people power. Yeah, with that perspective that you bring, you were in Kansas, you kind of oversaw a couple of other different states, and you were just mentioning there, Kansas, it's embedded with education, we're with economic development. Does that speak to the kind of customization of the building of programs that a state's I mean, they're not all called, you know, what we call MCSC, but their version of it, is it customized to what that state's end goal is? How does Missouri's focus 
differ from there and what kind of programs do we have? I know that's a really loaded question, but it just kind of sparked uh, yeah. in me with what you were saying there. I think it's so interesting. And I really appreciate that we're starting the conversation in this foundational lens because every state should revisit how these things evolve over time and make sure it still serves their needs. So in Missouri, we were founded through an executive order and we were originally housed within the lieutenant governor's office. There's something to be said for the stability of moving an organization outside of those elected official offices and into state government offices. But yes, exactly. We do that so that it can fit the vision and the long-term strategy of the elected officials and in turn, the constituents who vote for them. So yeah, our statute or our executive order 9408 is one of those documents that I went back to in my first days as executive director to understand what is our mission from the founding And how many commissioners should be serving? What are their expectations? And are we fulfilling that plan that they set for us? And we clearly are, and we clearly have opportunities to grow. Any indication on how it's changed from governor to governor? Does it change much at all, or is the the paths pretty similar? You know, the executive directors have changed over time, and I think some of that vision evolves with the executive director in addition to the change in the gubernatorial folks, I think that is probably an area that we have not leveraged significantly. Now, I'm new, and I don't want to overspeak, first of all. I could not understand the full history of this commission this quickly, but I would share that we can print the governor's priorities, we can look at our portfolio, but for me, the next level would be to visit with the governor's office personally to find out if there's gaps, regions that are underserved, priorities that are underserved, and figuring out in the next grant competition cycle how to fairly present those opportunities to the state of Missouri. I think that's something we can do moving forward, especially now that we have the staff in place at MCSC that understand that national perspective to make it happen. But there's a lot of factors there. And I know governors are busy people, Governor Parson alike. And so uh, I wouldn't want to assume to understand the full history. But it's my understanding there's, there's an opportunity for that. I mean, as we look to expand broadband statewide, as we look to make sure hunger issues are addressed statewide, we've seen an increase in those needs through the pandemic. There's a renewed interest in commissions and the funding we bring. Disaster response is an area that I was a part of helping deploy AmeriCorps members to Joplin after the Joplin tornado, I want to make sure the state of Missouri knows that we have resources to do the same in any disasters ahead of us. Fair enough on uh, the, the history side yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to throw you through a loop, but it just kind of <laughs> popped in my head there. Absolutely. Um, a little bit ago, you had quoted a number. I kind of wrote it down here, so forgive me if I wrote it down wrong. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 volunteers in Missouri within the, like the last year or so. Yes. Um, and I guess that's tied to AmeriCorps, and I want to jump into AmeriCorps here in a bit. But before we do, uh, can you talk about the the team of MCSC? We've kind of gotten a little bit of you, but there yeah. is a team that works under you. What are they doing versus, you know, what AmeriCorps is doing? I think uh, from what it sounds like, AmeriCorps is kind of boots on the ground. We're doing the volunteerism, but the MCSC team, what are they doing day-to-day basis uh, for volunteerism? Yeah, like I shared earlier, that federal legislation made sure that we could receive federal funds to allocate them to AmeriCorps in the state. But over time, it's become clear that commissions are really well positioned to mobilize volunteerism more broadly. And so while we continue to have AmeriCorps program officers that oversee the AmeriCorps programs in our portfolio, we also are expanding our work into having individuals in charge of leveraging volunteers, not with AmeriCorps. So the Show Me Service Awards are a great example of that, where we ask folks to go to showmeservice.org and nominate their peers for the volunteering they're doing. There's also an opportunity to nominate a business, for example. So there's different entities you can nominate. And then the governor's office joins us in celebrating those volunteers each year. That's a great way to just celebrate the generosity of the people of Missouri and also incentivize others to get involved and do it too. Uh, so that's Isaiah Maxey spearheading that, and he's over our our volunteer programs, if you will. And Chris Gardner, our deputy director, works closely with him to make sure that we, we get that done, in addition to uh, a needs assessment that we'll be doing in the months ahead, sharing it widely across the state to get input on what trainings are missing for volunteer mobilization and engagement and retention. And once we get that needs assessment data back, we'll be ready to schedule volunteer trainings around the state. I'd like to acknowledge that there's a lot of excellent organizations already out there 
doing these trainings. And if that's the case, it's about making sure that their contact info is easy to find. Okay. So it's a lot of preparing those AmeriCorps members and pointing them in the direction that the need is the most, right? And and making sure that we're covering everything that needs to be covered. Yeah. The only edit I'd have to what you said is we're doing that for volunteers. So not even AmeriCorps members, right? So AmeriCorps members are part of our grant portfolio and the programs that they serve with make sure that what their activities align with those programs. What Isaiah is doing is for the broader public. So any individual out there volunteering may want to attend the training or programs that don't have AmeriCorps funding have the opportunity to start learning best practices or just getting connected to what's already out there as we build this infrastructure, this fabric for all of us. Okay, perfect. So speaking of AmeriCorps, let's kind of jump in to that. I know we've been kind of talking around it. It's been mentioned a couple of times in the discussion here, but uh, let's just kind of start from the top. What is AmeriCorps? What do they do? I'm so glad you asked. I meant to say earlier in the conversation, I believe AmeriCorps is the modern civilian conservation corps. You go over to Lake of the Ozarks, those facilities are built by the civilian conservation corps. This federal program put people to work after the recession or the depression may be the more appropriate term. Civilian Conservation Corps had a huge impact on our nation at an important time. AmeriCorps funding is right there to do the same thing now. So what is AmeriCorps? Another way to define it would be to say it's the domestic version of the Peace Corps. So some folks know the term Peace Corps, right? You sign up to serve for a year overseas. We know the needs are great right here in this country. So some folks may want to serve overseas. Some folks may want to serve right here in the United States with AmeriCorps, or they could serve right here in Missouri with AmeriCorps. We recruit young people from around the country to come to Missouri to serve in AmeriCorps. We hope some of them stay. We also send some young Missourians across the nation to serve in AmeriCorps, and they're out there seeing the world and gathering skills to bring back to Missouri. Uh, There's a lot of different kinds of AmeriCorps. There's AmeriCorps Vista, which does capacity building behind the scenes. You serve within an organization side by side with employees, but your mission's a little different. AmeriCorps State and National, That's direct service, so you're not behind the scenes doing capacity building. You're right out there helping serve food. You're helping maintain state park trails. There's a lot of important AmeriCorps state and national members. And then I'm an AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps alum, so I can't help but mention in Triple C, because that's when you get to deploy to another place and join a team of 10 people, and every six weeks you move around. Maybe you do roofing with Habitat for Humanity and then Six weeks later, you're helping out with the wetlands in Appalachia. Very diverse set of skill building and and experiences. AmeriCorps just can really open a lot of doors for people. Yeah, sounds like it. I want to kind of touch on something real quick. Uh, You've mentioned Triple C a couple of times. Maybe you had mentioned what Triple C is. What what is Triple C? Yeah, so in Triple C is National Civilian Community Corps. And that is the federal AmeriCorps, where they have different bases around the country. So I know they have one in Denver. I mentioned I served in D.C. I know that campus is now closed. But there's regions, I think there's one in Iowa, and then there's one in the southern region, too. But there's different campuses around the country. And when you sign up for AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps in Triple C, uh, you have the opportunity to kind of be based in one of those campuses and then deployed every six weeks to different places. Okay. So there's a lot of different AmeriCorps programs. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that something that used to be called Senior Corps is now called AmeriCorps Seniors. So to increase brand recognition, if you're 55 and older, there's a lot of excellent opportunities to get out there and serve as an AmeriCorps member. Uh, you do get a living stipend. One of the most powerful AmeriCorps senior programs that I would mention, just as we continue to break the stereotype that it's just young people out there serving in AmeriCorps, older folks are too. One of the most powerful programs is called the Foster Grandparents Program. And I have seen those older individuals support the classrooms and rock those children in the morning on Monday mornings after they've had a hard weekend, sing songs, support the teachers who have large classrooms. The Foster Grandparent Program is just really one powerful example of how AmeriCorps benefiting people of all ages and serving people of all ages. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like there's quite the option if somebody wants to volunteer. It seems like it's all covered in all facets. Is there any limitations on what AmeriCorps can do or what volunteerism can do, or is it just open to anything and everything? You know, it's pretty broad. It comes back to that priorities conversation. So we got to make sure that what we're doing fits the priorities of the governor and the needs of the state of Missouri 
we have to be impact driven. We've got to have the data to justify the activities. So there are limits and there's an accountability to making sure that taxpayer dollars are being spent in a meaningful way. So we're, we keep an eye on that. And there's a defined list of prohibited activities, you know, like we don't get involved in um, political seasons and there, there's activities, you know, that, that we don't do. But no, it is really broad and that is intentional because we need to make sure that when an organization identifies a need and needs some support to build out something new that they want to do, that we're here to help. And so we just encourage folks to ask the question, you know, what is AmeriCorps? How could it help? And then we have exploratory conversations to figure out if, it, if it's a fit. Then we look at the next grant competition cycle and try to get ahead of it so they can start planning ahead. It certainly is a federal program, so there's areas of accountability, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And then our job is to make it accessible and doable. Make sure the page limits are not too big on these grant applications so people can pull it off. And and when I brought up compliance right out the gate of this conversation, it's because our job is to make sure that that compliance is accessible too and people can feel empowered to use the funds in an allowable way. For anybody who is listening or even if they're not listening and they're out there somewhere, if they want to join AmeriCorps or volunteerism in general, if it's not AmeriCorps specific, how do they do that? What's the process like? I just want to note there's two ways you might want to come out of AmeriCorps. You might be an individual that wants to serve. And in that case, I would encourage you to go to AmeriCorps.gov, A-M-E-R-I-C-O-R-P-S. So sometimes people say AmeriCorps. We don't do that, but it is AmeriCorps.gov. I just want to help spell that for you and learn more about it. Just see the different avenues of service. And then if you're ready to get connected to an organization in Missouri, you could always go to showmeservice.org and track down our contact information and we'll help you know who's recruiting right now in Missouri for AmeriCorps members. AmeriCorps members get a living stipend and they also get an education award to support their education. And some schools will match that education award. So there's a lot to look into as an individual. And then if you are a nonprofit organization, a faith-based organization here in Missouri and you're hearing about AmeriCorps, I would invite you to go to showmeservice.org and find my contact information or Jacob Soans, who's over the AmeriCorps programs here, and we'll, we can have a, a chat about whether or not it's a good fit for your organization. And for those who sign up for the first time, is there anything expected of them? I mean, I'd imagine it's not as strict as like signing up from the Army. Like you sign up like, hey, you're in the Army now. But right. if somebody signs up, is there um, like a bulleted list of like, we require you to do this, we expect you to do this, that kind of thing? There are going to be age constraints for different AmeriCorps programs. So you'll want to check to see, does this one require 18 to 24? Does this one require 55 and up? So there are different age restrictions depending on the program. There is a certain level of physicality to the NCCC program we've talked about a couple times, and different AmeriCorps positions require more than others. It's really specific to the organization and how they post the AmeriCorps opportunity. So just like we talked about, the opportunities are diverse. The people serving in these roles are diverse. And so I wouldn't want anybody to hold themselves back thinking they don't have what it takes. There's probably an opportunity out there that fits what they're passionate about and able to do. We can look into those details, but no, AmeriCorps members are incredibly diverse. Uh, Let's change gears just a little bit and just talk about volunteerism in itself. Then we'll kind of just start with kind of an obvious question, I guess, or the answer might be obvious, but why is volunteerism important? You want the answer to be obvious, but sometimes you think maybe it's not these days, right? We've become more separated from one another. We're having trouble connecting to people that are different from us, just The pandemic was isolating for some of us. There's a lot of reasons why volunteering is on the back burner when we're all kind of in survival mode. Yet bringing back that volunteering, and clearly Missouri didn't lapse. We were in the top 10 in the nation, but we've got room to, to grow. Volunteerism matters because it keeps us connected. And I think as we look towards the future of really challenging topics, volunteerism can be overlooked as part of the solution. So when we have communities that feel like they're getting smaller, not bigger, having people out there volunteering helps them feel more invested in their community, increases community pride, increases the chances that they'll stay in that community. So for some communities, volunteerism isn't just fun, it's necessary because also when there's limited funding in these smaller communities, volunteerism is connecting the dots where the funding is not. 
And that's what I mean by people power is a lot of this can be unmeasured and off grid and informal helping your neighbor shovel their driveway when they can no longer do so. And yet this is the fabric of who we are as Americans. And so to figure out ways that we can inspire more of that is quite the calling. Any success stories over your, you know, I was about to say long uh, (laughs) career. I didn't want to make it sound like you're old, so I apologize there. But any um, success stories from your time of volunteering or your time, the short time you've been here with DED, anything that you've seen that kind of puts that in perspective? There are so many good stories. That's a lot of pressure to pick out a couple, but I'm going to pick out two just for the value of storytelling. One is, as an AmeriCorps member myself, I pinched a nerve in my back and I was taken out of service, right? We were doing trail digging and I could no longer complete my service hours. And so the folks that were helping me serve came up with a creative solution. They said, can you help with some grant writing for this wetlands preservation? I'd never done grant writing. And as a young person, I sat down and I read the instructions and I wrote the grant. And that young group of high schoolers got a free trip to Disney World and they got their wetlands grant, right? I am in charge of federal grants today on a much larger level. And I attribute it to moments like that when somebody trusted me. And that's what volunteerism can do. So it's one story of like, you don't know where it's going to end, but I can tell you where that started. And I think that's, that's pretty great. The other success story that I would tell When I did work for the Corporation for National and Community Service, I played a small part in helping make sure some AmeriCorps members were deployed to Joplin. And I carry that story with me as a point of inspiration because the government rules are there and there's limitations and it can be hard to navigate that. But if we do and folks stay engaged with government and believe that it can help, then there's a way. And we figured it out after Joplin. AmeriCorps was instrumental in helping rebuild Joplin. That's just an example of how it's important that we don't shy away from these government programs and we continue to invest in them and believe in them because they'll be there uh, when it matters most. And I think also seeing the the fruits of the effort. You know, I, I, I would not say I'm a volunteer. I mean, I've, you know, I've done it like once or twice here in the department as, you know, teams kind of go out. Uh, but in terms of the Joplin uh, thing, before I worked for DED, I worked for Office of Administration and we put together uh, kind of like a little video package deal for like the five-year anniversary of, of Joplin. And going down there, you would almost think that nothing had happened down there. They had rebuilt the town. They had rebuilt the houses. And I'd seen the footage of the name of the actual program. But it was like teams and, and volunteers and stuff helping rebuild houses. And we talked to the people down there and to kind of see the impact of that work and how it helped that community come back and how grateful everybody was that that help was there. And and you literally see it like there was nothing left. And now the houses are there and the businesses are back. It's quite powerful when you kind of see it. I know that's an exaggerated moment because they're not always like that. But when you do see it in that, that context, I mean, it kind of really lends itself to the importance of, you know, what we were talking about uh, just a bit ago about how volunteerism is important to communities who really do need it. Yes, and the ripple effect, we talk about it, and it can be cheesy, but it is so true. So our current commission chair is Jennifer Ingraham. She's out of Kansas City. And so when I tell her the Joplin story, she says, well, I just went down to Joplin for an anniversary. And when they found out I was associated with AmeriCorps as part of this commission, she said they were thanking me personally for what we did in Joplin. Now, she wasn't serving at that time. She she wasn't an AmeriCorps member. And yet it was so personal for the individuals there to be able to say, thank you. We, I remember what AmeriCorps did. And so, yes, it is a bit of an exaggeration. It is always on such a dramatic scale, what happened in Joplin and then the recovery. This is happening in small ways all around Missouri all the time. I just went to Eldon, Missouri a couple weeks ago. I think eggs and issues, issues and eggs. They invited me out there. They have something called Democracy Day, and they have Lots of individuals speak about the way they're serving the state of Missouri. And imagine the ripple effect for those elementary school kids hearing that. So, yeah, it's happening every day. I can't wait to collect more stories in my role as ED here. Yeah, for sure. I think we talked about it, or you had mentioned a a figure at the top of our discussion here. But is there a dollar amount that can be put on the impact of volunteerism within Missouri? 
Yes. So this is where I'm thankful to have that census data combined with this uh, National AmeriCorps report. So there's two ways that they measured volunteerism in Missouri. They looked at formal volunteerism, like you call, you sign up through United Way or another organization. That's formal volunteerism. And then when they did the survey and they also talked to residents about their informal volunteerism, the example of helping shovel a neighbor's driveway, for example. So when you look at those two different kinds of volunteerism, you've got 1.4 million Missourians engaged in formal volunteerism, 2.4 engaged in informal volunteerism. So way to go, Missouri. That's some great, great data that shows a lot of Missourians were out there volunteering. This is from September 2020 to September 2021. So it's a one-year snapshot. So when we look at the economic impact of that, they were able to find $3.1 billion dollars impacting the state of Missouri. That's billion with a B. Billion with a B. Jeez. Yes. And and this comes back to that public private partnership concept. For every one dollar that is spent by the state or federal government, we want to see a return that's higher than a dollar. Right? The job is to generate additional funds. And so I'm proud that when we take AmeriCorps programming to small towns in Missouri, that there is some level of match. Now there's match waivers because there's been a pandemic organizations have gone through a lot. So there's waivers for that match, but also to the elected officials listening or the taxpayers that are scrutinizing this concept. When we talk about $3.1 billion in impact, we're talking about some of those monies coming from local. We're talking about the value of what a volunteer's time and talent. And then we're also talking about the federal dollars. And combined, it's a huge economic impact on our state. There's a lot thicker data out there to dig into to more of the numbers. But on a, on a high level, we can see how many people volunteered and we can see that there's a huge impact. Yeah. So I guess, again, not to, not to keep beating a dead horse, but that's a lot of money, a lot of time that's going towards people. I think, again, just hammers home that concept of this is important and, and people really do need it and they rely on it. Yes, and it's just become a fabric of who we are as Americans to help one another. There's an infrastructure around it. The government's partnering with nonprofit and for-profit, and together we can move the mark on some of these challenges that otherwise you're not sure how you're going to get it done. Yeah, I guess kind of a a soft transition similar to what we were just talking about there. Uh, What is currently happening within MCSC? Upcoming events, initiatives happening. I know we've talked about the Show Me or we mentioned the Show Me Service Awards, that sure we'll dive into that a bit, but what's currently happening? What's what's on the horizon? So right now we are in the thick of our grant review for our AmeriCorps portfolio. And so for those that have been listening that are like, but where do I, what's the timing of all this? In the fall, we will release our notice of funding And then that process kicks in through May of applying, reviewing, and then our commission ultimately voting on that portfolio. So we're in the thick of that right now. And in May, our commissioners will come together here in Jefferson City to determine who will be in our AmeriCorps portfolio. So what I would say to folks listening is this fall, that process kicks off again, and we would love to see new applicants enter the pool. And so as you go to showmeservice.org, you can reach out to us and we can make sure that you could even see last year's notice of funding just to get an idea. But that we're really in the thick of that grant review. And it's a very important part of our work that I'm really slowing down to highlight thoroughly here because there are nonprofit organizations that have had successful programs for years that need us to once again renew their funding, make sure those AmeriCorps members are still on the ground in Missouri. That's what we're in right now to make sure that that gets done. As we look towards the summer, we'll have our AmeriCorps program director training. In the fall, we'll have opening day where AmeriCorps members come together and say the pledge, which is a powerful moment. And along the way, we'll have the Show Me Service Awards. So we don't have the date and the venue solidified yet for the Show Me Service Awards, but we know they're going to happen this summer. We are thankful for Governor Parsons' support on the Show Me Service Awards. It brings the prestige to them that they deserve. And we would ask people to apply because right now we're accepting nominations. So now's the right time to go to showmeservice.org and make sure if you know of an outstanding individual that they're considered or an outstanding organization. What are the categories for the awards? Well, I know there's an individual category. I know there's a business category. I think there's one or two others. And I do think there's a lens on making sure that every region is represented. Okay, great. The importance of showcasing the work and honoring or awarding those who are outstanding in their chosen path. Can you talk a little bit about that, about 
the recognition that obviously volunteerism isn't about recognition, but there is an element of honoring those who go above and beyond. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's exactly why we have to make sure we build recognition into the process because volunteerism, it's not always inherent in the process to stop and celebrate impact and celebrate the individuals that made it happen. And that's exactly why we have to make sure that there's things in place that it happens because we don't, we don't want folks to burn out first of all. So you can think of every nonprofit board or even some of those volunteer programs in your own town some of the same folks are showing up every day to get it done. Those folks can get tired. And it's important that we take the time to celebrate them. In addition, when we celebrate them, there might be someone coming up behind them that says, I should step in. They, you know, they need a little help. And look, by celebrating them, we now have a second person that wants to step up. So there's just something to be said anecdotally for celebrating people. But then on a more technical level, it's been studied. uh, I can't fully reference it here, that there are a certain number of steps of volunteer engagement we would do to succeed. From the beginning, making sure that what you assign a volunteer meets their interests, to making sure they've received sufficient training to do it. And then at the end, celebrating them, acknowledging them. This is all part of how you keep volunteers engaged in a community. So when I talked earlier about the Missouri Community Service Commission getting involved in setting up these statewide trainings for volunteers, that's because we want to bring those best practices to light. And then you see right there on paper that a very important part of the process is celebrating your volunteers. So we want to do it on a statewide level. We're hoping organizations are doing it on a city level, and then they're doing it within their organizations too. And so it's really modeling the best way to keep a volunteer engaged in an organization, knowing that so many organizations depend on those volunteers. Well, I feel like we've covered quite a lot of content here. We, we talked about the high-level stuff of the who, what, why, where, the kind of the, the facets of where people can volunteer, how they can volunteer if they want to. Before I open up the floor to you to kind of just, you know, fill in the cracks on anything that we might have missed, just real quick, one last thing on the Show Me Service Award nominations. If somebody wants to nominate somebody, vote on something or, or what have you, where can they go to do that? Yeah, so it's right there on the homepage of our website. So if you go to showmeservice.org, right there front and center, you'll see we're accepting nominations. And if you have any questions about that, you'll also see where you can email us to ask questions. But just go to showmeservice.org, check out those categories. You can read the criteria a little bit more in, in depth. And please consider nominating somebody, especially if you're from southwestern Missouri or southeastern Missouri. So we do not just want St. Louis, Kansas City, Columbia, Jeff City represented in these awards. We need to make sure we get out there. And so right now, off the top of my head, I could tell you we need a few more applications from southwest Missouri. We'd love to see those come in. Okay. Uh, Before I close this out here with our last question, I'll just open up the floor to you. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you think people should know or that you would like to talk about? I just say that I stand on the shoulders of the executive directors that have come before me that have made sure that volunteerism and service stay strong in Missouri. But this is a new season, right? I've been executive director for 90 days, maybe. So if there are ideas or if you've heard this interview and you've heard gaps or a misunderstanding, I'm new to Missouri. I am open to that feedback. That's only going to make this organization stronger. I think it's a It's the first day of spring, I said. I started. It's a new season for this organization and for myself, too. And it's a really great time to get involved with the commission. We even have a few openings on the commission itself. So if there's individuals that want to be a part of voting on where the funds go from the Missouri Community Service Commission or want to weigh in on the priorities of this commission, you might consider on a more strategic level putting your name for consideration to serve on the commission itself. And again, if you go to showmeservice.org, you can find my contact information there. I'm Brittany Crabtree, and and I'd be happy to get you connected to the appointments office of the governor's office here because we want every spot filled so we can have a diverse group of folks voting on the funds. Yeah. All right. So I'm sure, as you know, the department's motto is helping Missourians prosper. So how does the work that you do, the work that the team of uh, MCSC, how does all of that push that motto forward? The answer seems very obvious, but I still like to ask it anyhow. It is so obvious. Just go back and listen to the podcast. (laughs) But let me just say that word prosper. I would ask you to consider what it means to prosper and what a quality of life means for everybody. 
And I think as we look around at one another and know we want to help one another, then we've got to take the next step and figure out how to do it. And that's how, how we make sure we all prosper. Yeah, quality of life. That's what volunteerism and service makes sure we have in a more wraparound way to the traditional ways that we think about economic investment. Perfect. I think that's a, a great uh, closing out quote there. Brittany, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's busy for everybody, so I do appreciate it. And hopefully the listeners gleaned something and hopefully you guys get a few more volunteers from this. Awesome. Thanks so much. Let's do it again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Inside Eco Devo. We have great episodes coming your way every two weeks, so be sure to subscribe. Also, we want to hear from you, our listeners. Tell us what economic development topics you want to hear more about. This helps us fulfill our motto of helping Missourians prosper by bringing content to our listeners that they want to hear. Leave a comment on an episode or send an email to ded.communications at ded.mo.gov and stay tuned for more Inside EcoDevo.